These last 12 weeks, we've had an amazing kind of biblical tour uh, of um, different people, different characters under the heading of unqualified. And we come to the end of that series today, and we thought we'd finish with a bit of a bang. So we're going to look at, under the heading of unqualified, Jesus. Uh, also with a bit of a feel of celebration. Is that okay? Good. Um, so... Uh, Faith's going to come and read to us, and as she comes forward, let us just bow our heads in prayer. Uh, We remember that uh, in John's Gospel, he writes that some Greeks came to the disciple Philip and said, Sir, sir, we would see Jesus. So Holy Spirit, we say, we would see Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit, and show us more of Jesus. Let us just enjoy gazing upon him. We ask it in his lovely name. Amen. So the reading is taken from Isaiah 53, verses 1 to 5. Who has believed our message? And And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hid their faces, he was despised and we held held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Faith. I wonder whether any of you would admit to watching eight out of ten cats does count down. Yeah, some of you would. Yeah, it's, um, it's pretty offensive. But it's funny. And as you probably know, it's a feature of English culture that if you can make people laugh, you can get away with pretty much anything. I confess as lads, we used to say, you know, if you can get the girl to laugh, you're halfway to second base. <laughs> Recently, on 8 out of 10, They were talking about Easter. And Jimmy Carr wraps it up. Yes, it's Easter. The reason we celebrate Easter is because 2,000 years ago, a man walked on water, got crucified, and then rose from the dead. (laughs) You couldn't make it up. Oh, wait. They did. Funny. But if he meant that seriously, he's so wrong. And when it comes to the solid history of Jesus and the impact that he's had on the world, he couldn't be more wrong. Though on the face of it, Jesus could hardly be a more unlikely, a more unqualified candidate as someone to change the world. Humanly speaking, Jesus was weak. I mean, he wasn't popular. The reading tells us he was despised, rejected, a man of sorrows. Interestingly, that he wasn't handsome. You know, he wouldn't have made the cut for Love Island. He didn't have a lot of followers on uh, Twitter, a lot of friends on Facebook, no network on LinkedIn. But more seriously, he had no wealth, he had no significant possessions, no position, no credentials, except himself. You know, he grew up in a primitive village, the child of a peasant. His active career lasted barely three years. And on leaving, he entrusts his legacy to a little band of uneducated, uninfluential, unqualified fishermen types. He had none of the accoutrements or qualifications normally associated with influence or status. It would be hard to choose a more unqualified candidate to change the world. But I'm going to put to you that Jesus, the man, Jesus, 
is the most influential, the most powerful agent for change who ever lived. It's impossible to comprehend the history of the world without thinking of him. You know, if Jimmy Carr and his like don't see the immense impact that this unqualified carpenter has had on the life of man on this planet, the reason is simple. We're immersed in it. Let me explain. It's 2019. Luke, in an effort to date the birth of Jesus, tells us that Augustus was emperor and Quirinius was governor of Syria. Over time, the power of every Caesar faded. But the power and influence of this unqualified carpenter on human imagination and endeavor grew and grew until in the 6th century, a Romanian monk, Dionysius Exegus, formulated Anno Domini, marking events, not from the beginning of Rome, but from the birth of this man. The creation of the calendar was not a technical convenience. It was a statement of reality that the critical fulcrum event that splits history in two is the entry of this man. You know, if you were a visitor to Jerusalem in 30 AD and you were asked to bet who's going to last longer, the Roman Empire or this carpenter and his little motley band? <laughs> now, 2,000 years later, we call our children, as you probably know, Peter, Paul, John, Mary, and our dogs, Brutus and Caesar. <laughs> we call our tube station, our station St. Paul's, St. James, St. John's Wood, St. Pancras, our towns, St. Albans, St. Abbs, St. Andrews, St. Ives, St. Helens. <laughs> Do you know there are a hundred San Franciscos in the world? Why? Because there was a man called Francis who loved Jesus. You can't open up a map or a calendar without seeing the ripples of Jesus. The index of a world atlas has pages and pages of the names of people who were inspired by Jesus. And they went on to inspire others. So they named their towns after them. More seriously, let's talk about children. And I'm indebted to a, a Norwegian theologian at this point called, called um, Beg, who, Back who in 2005 wrote a book called When Children Became People. In the ancient world, children were considered non-persons. The high infant mortality rate deterred emotional attachment, and pagan authors actually often referred to children as plants. The abandonment of unwanted children, especially girls, was a frequent practice, and the survival of those who made it was often via sexual exploitation and other forms of slavery. This is the world that Jesus came into. And the mothers brought their children to Jesus that he might bless them. The disciples said, no, go away. Jesus said, bring them to me. Let me bless them, for of such is the kingdom of God. And he changed the intrinsic worth of children in that moment. The concept of children, of childhood, as we understand it, is a Christian invention. The cultural idea of children as treasured people was a consequence of a stupendous and revolutionary idea that every human being is treasured and beloved of God. Who told us that? Who demonstrated that? This man. Let's talk for a moment about women. In ancient societies and today, in societies where the norms are not based on convictions drawn from Jesus, women seen as second-class citizens. As not even citizens, just second-class, as lower value. But Jesus changed that. He broke the code. He approached a Samaritan woman and gave her worth. And in that moment, he changed the future for millions of women. 
In ancient Rome, widows, if they didn't remarry within two years, were fined because they were seen as a, a drag on the economy. Jesus, at, even at the cross, turns to John and says, Son, your mother. He placed in that moment intrinsic value on the disadvantaged and an obligation on those who can to care for others. Do you know, Jesus changed the way we think about education. He told us to love God with all your mind. Augustine, the monk, the first Archbishop of Canterbury, he took up this theme and he understood that all truth is God's truth. So he studied the writings of Greeks, the Greeks and the Romans, Aristotle, Plato, Socrates. These are fundamental to academia in the modern era. And they, in the monasteries, they were carefully kept and copied and disseminated and passed from generation to generation. Otherwise, they would have been lost. We wouldn't have known about them. Then came the universities. Paris, Oxford, Cambridge, founded by followers of Jesus. Rome, Naples, Vienna, Heidelberg, all reflected the idea that God is supremely rational. Universities as a movement were begun by followers of Jesus. The first in the English-speaking world, Oxford, still has as its motto, Psalm 27, the Lord is my light. The first university in the USA, Harvard, still has as its first precept, its first rule, let every student be plainly instructed that the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ and to lay Christ as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. And what about schools? Hmm? Inspired by Jesus, Christ followers established and ran schools hundreds of years before the 1944 Education Act and the state came along. The names of half our schools are an obvious reminder of this. What about science? Hmm. What would our lives be like without all the scientific progress and discoveries and knowledge that we've accumulated in the modern era? Hmm. <laughs> Alfred North Whitehead one of the dominant thinkers of the 20th century asks, what was it that made it possible for science to emerge when it did? He answers, it was the medieval insistence on the rationality of God. That all things are created by a God of reason. And this belief, he says, gave the confidence that led to the rise of science. Now, this is not to say that without this influence, science couldn't have otherwise arisen, but as an organized, sustained enterprise, science has arisen only once in human history. In Europe, in a civilization called Christendom. Have you ever thought, where did hospitals come from? Jesus healed and cared for the blind, the sick, and the lame. What an example. And a Christ follower, following his example, called Benedict, in sharing in the life of Jesus in the fifth century, invented what was in effect the first hospital. And by the sixth century, it became common practice for the, for the Benedictine monasteries to have hospitals attached to them. When you speak of St. Anthony's, St. George's, St. Thomas's, you speak of a movement inspired by Jesus. Now, I'm not saying that there would be no compassion without Christianity, but what I am saying is that wherever you have an institution of self-giving, be it hospitals, orphanages, schools, or care for the homeless, provided for those who are unlikely to be able to repay, the probability is it has its roots in Jesus. Quiz question. 
What's Cyrillic? It's an alphabet. It's the third official alphabet of the European Union after Latin that we have and the Greek. Yeah, and it's used by 250 million people in Eastern Europe and in parts of Asia. Where did it come from? Well, it comes as a consequence of a Christian missionary called St. Cyril. He was a missionary to the Slavs. Why was it developed? So they'd be able to read about Jesus. In acts of magnificent heroism, inspired by Jesus, his followers have traveled to foreign countries, learned the languages, and codified the language into a written form. Why? To translate the scriptures. And as a byproduct, they have gifted to those people their own written language. The first efforts at the scientific study of languages was by Christian missionaries. They compiled the first dictionaries. They wrote the first grammars. You know, what is known as the modern era that we live in was ushered in in the late 15th century in Gutenberg, in Strasbourg, by Gutenberg's invention of movable type. And what was he trying to achieve? What was it that inspired him and energized him? What was the book that took 20 years for a monk to write a single handwritten copy of, but Gutenberg could produce and publish a stock of 200, the first print run of a book anywhere ever in the world? What was it that drove him? It was the Jesus book. And what about music or the arts? Well, we'd need a lot of time for this. But try to imagine a world with no system for musical notation. Hmm? Yeah, this was invented by Christ followers to enable collective worship. Imagine no Martin Luther, whose, whose German Bible was the primary shaper of the modern German language. Or no King James Bible, which with Shakespeare is the primary shaper of the English language which we speak. No Bach, who signed every word to the glory, every work to the glory of God alone. No Hallelujah Chorus. No Gregorian Chant. No Sistine Chapel. No Da Vinci Last Supper. No Michelangelo Pieta. You could just go on and on. There has simply been no transcendent vision of reality. No cosmic story that has gripped the artistic imagination like the vision of this carpenter from Nazareth. Moving on, what about social impact? You know, one of the curses of our age is addiction. Addiction to... Alcohol, drugs, pornography, overeating. Addiction is like bonds. It ties you to something you don't really want to be tied to. But Jesus releases the power to break those bonds. And Alcoholics Anonymous, with its worldwide meetings, came straight out of the community of Jesus followers who were seeking to deploy the transforming power of Jesus to rescue lives that were sinking. I wish I had time to speak of Wilberforce, Shaftesbury, Newton, Fry, Bernardo, George Muller, Hudson Taylor, George Carey, or a long list of other men and women, like those who are standing in front of us this morning talking about Lighthouse. Just for a moment, think. It was wonderful to hear of the, the work and the ministry of what this what Lighthouse is doing. But just think for a moment, if there was no Jesus, would that be happening? And thousands of works like it all over the world? A long list of men and women inspired and energized by Jesus and through whom he has been working transformation throughout the world, throughout history. But not only does Jesus have the power to change history, to change circumstances. He can change convictions and prejudices. Jesus and, and the disciples, they're on their way to Jerusalem. They need to get there before nightfall. 
But a voice cries out, Jesus, help me, I'm blind. The disciples say, shh. They get a bad press, the disciples, don't they? Shh, Jesus is busy, he's on his way. But Jesus responds. And in that moment with blind Bartimaeus, no longer blind, Jesus changed the position, the status of the disabled and the disadvantaged. He showed us how to value, how to care. They arrive at the house with feet covered in muck. It's a rural economy with no sanitation as we know it. And one of the disciples I can imagine says, well, where's the boy? Where's the boy who washes their feet? He's not here. I can imagine them thinking, well, I'm not going to be washing any feet. And uh, Jesus takes a bowl and a towel. And in that moment, he transforms the way that generations of Jesus followers will think about serving others or doing the menial task. And they brought a woman caught in the very act of adultery. You know the story. Where are they? Does no one condemn you? No one, my Lord. And neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. And in that moment, Jesus showed there is no condemnation for those who come to him for forgiveness and restoration. I love that old hymn. Man of sorrows, wondrous name, for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah. What a Saviour. And he can change hearts. He comes to Jericho. Crowds of people welcoming him now. He looks up and he sees in a tree a little man, stunt of a man, a reject, a swindler, a cheat, a traitor. And Jesus in that moment showed that even for those who think they are too far gone, rejected, isolated, alienated, there is hope. There is a new start. There are the open arms of Jesus. Jesus, through inspired Christ followers, changed political theory and human rights. He shaped our understanding of justice. These words, for example, from one of our old colonies. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and have been endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Where did Thomas Jefferson get that idea? The idea that all are created equal and valuable and with certain rights was certainly not evident to the Romans or the Vikings or the Nazis or those who live at the top of a caste system. It came from an idea that all, the blind, the lame, the leper, the disabled, every race, every gender, have been created by a good God in his image and are loved by him. And it was his spirit who inspired these words in Galatians 3. There is now neither Jew nor Greek, male nor female, slave nor free, but all are one in Christ Jesus. And here we are. Where, before the church, did this ever happen? Until Jesus, there had never been the idea of a community like this. Search the ancient documents of Greece or Rome. You won't find it. This, here in Galatians 3, is the first ever, anywhere, recorded expression of egalitarianism. That all have equal dignity and equal worth. The love of enemies, the love of God, you don't find that anywhere else in the ancient world. No one was saying this about Zeus or Baal or Odin. None of these said, there is a God of love. Where did that come from? Only from this man. And as if all this wasn't enough, it's no exaggeration to say that he brought into being the most influential movement 
of all time. Imagine no St. Paul's, no Church of England, no worldwide Catholic or Orthodox Church, no house church in China, no Peter, no Paul, Aquinas, Augustine, Origen, St. Francis, Mother Teresa, no Martin Luther, no Martin Luther King Jr., no David Livingstone, no Dietrich Bonhoeffer, no Joan of Arc, no John Calvin, no John Wesley, John Milton, John Newton, John Bunyan, John McLennan, John McKenzie, John Bajensky, who's not there, or John Dowdswell. This movement, which by all rights and expectations should have died with him, 2,000 years later, here we are, 2 point something billion of us. What can we say of this man? He is the hinge of history. The greatest teacher who ever lived. The greatest mind who ever thought. The leader of the greatest movement the world has ever seen. He alone mastered life. He alone conquered death. He alone destroyed guilt and shame. He was a man of sorrows for our sakes. But he is the King of kings. He is the Lord of lords. He is the Son of God. He is the only one qualified to be an all-sufficient Saviour. He's amazing. He's the greatest change agent of all time. Nothing is too difficult for him. All the armies that ever marched, all the navies that ever sailed, all the kings and queens that ever reigned, all the parliaments that ever sat, put together, have not affected and benefited the life of man on this planet as powerfully, as profoundly as this one solitary life. How did he do it? How did he do it? Well, that would be another multifaceted talk, wouldn't it? But let's just give a moment to three of those facets. How did he do it? Well, firstly, when he left physically, he didn't leave us alone. He said, I'll send you another comforter. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Why? To be my representatives, to be my witnesses, to carry forward the work that I have begun. Secondly, when he left, he didn't leave us empty-handed, he left us his gospel. When you survey the grandeur of the Alps or the Himalayas or the Grand Canyon, you might be a bit breathless and you might think, this wasn't made by man. No man could make this. And when you survey the grandeur of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the grace, the undeserved kindness of God, that he allowed himself to be a man of sorrows, despised, rejected, wounded for our sins, my sin, that his sufferings are the means of our healing. That he redeems my life from the pit. He redeemed my life from a pit. What if you know that he's done that for you? You know, when you look at the gospel of Jesus Christ and you survey the grandeur of it, you know this is not something man could make up. Paul writes, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to all who have faith. Thirdly, third facet, before he left, he showed us what love is. He said, greater love has no one than this than to lay their life down for their friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. He taught us, with all you are, love God. Love one another, love your enemies. The genius Emperor Napoleon writes, I know men, and I tell you that Jesus is no mere man, 
Between him and every other person, there is no possible comparison. Alexander, Caesar, Charlemagne and I founded empires. But on what did we rest the creations of our genius? Upon force. Jesus founded his empire, he says, upon love. And at this hour, millions would die for him. I search in vain in history, he says, to find anyone similar to Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we have his spirit. We have his gospel. We have received his love. The love of the most powerful change agent of all time. And do you know what? He's still recruiting change agents. Uh Uh-oh. Brian's just switched into the application phase. But as wind down, let's you know, start filtering at this point. Let's just take a pit stop for a moment. We started by saying you couldn't make it up. You know, if you were Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, and you were making it up, just think for a moment. What would you choose as the first miraculous sign to pre- start presenting Jesus? You know, it's got to be pretty good, hasn't it? It's got to be something pretty strong, something pretty inqu- quintessential. You know, walking on water, raising him, raising someone from the dead. So what, was, what, what did they record as the first miraculous sign? I'll tell you what, if you were making it up, you would not in a million years choose that the first thing Jesus did is he solves a little problem of social embarrassment. Some youngsters have organised a party for their wedding and they've run, in, they've, run out of, they've run out of wine. Oh dear! You'd never pick that, honestly. Why, do they, why does John put that right at the front end? as the first miracle. Hmm? Tell you why. There's only one reason. Well, it's two actually. Because it was. The other reason is because it's full of signs. But that's another talk. Jesus, in that moment, he transforms 150 gallons of water into 150 gallons of the choicest wine. He is the ultimate joy bringer. He turns a failing flat party into a phenomenal party. Jesus is the one who will turn the water of your life into wine. He's the most powerful change agent of all time and he's still recruiting change agents. People like you, people like me, who carry his spirit, his gospel, his love within them. And are eager to take forward his mission of changing the world. One moment, one conversation, one loving act, one relationship, one person at a time. So, will you carry with you his spirit, his gospel, his love? Is that you? Or are you feeling a bit unqualified? Well, I hope by now, after this series, you know you are qualified. If your heart is open to Jesus to be used, you qualify. He said it. Follow me and I will make you. I hope you're convinced by now that Jesus changed the world. But he did it through people like you. Will you change the world? Will you change the world? just a little bit, by your words, your acts of love, you're living a distinctive Christian life. You know, one of the reasons that I love coming to church is I get to look around and I see people whose hearts and lives and circumstances have been transformed, changed by Jesus, who've received the baton. You know, We get to carry a baton, a gospel baton. Will you pass it on? Do you know how close the church is to extinction? Do you know how close the church is to extinction? One generation. It always has been. If this generation doesn't pass on the baton, that will be the end of it. So will you, like Jesus, be a change agent, a gospel carrier, not just a passive receiver of grace. When Jesus encountered people, 
He changed the trajectory, the direction of their lives. Jesus in you can do that. Without question, this unqualified carpenter changed the world. But at base, what did Jesus change? He changed hearts. He changed people. And they changed the world. You can be part of that. Do you want to be part of that? He can do that through you, if you're willing.